Hey you and welcome. My name is Mike and in this old video, we're gonna look at, guess what? The case of Jessica Herringer, which would only be surprising if you didn't look at the thumbnail or title of the video. Jessica Herringer went missing from a petrol, well, gas station. This is set in America, so may as well speak American. Yeah, she went missing from a gas station in Michigan in 2013. The search to find out what happened would be extensive and go on for years, until what the police kind of randomly found would turn out to be a lot more disturbing than what they had originally thought. It would also solve a separate cold case and lead them to one just giant piece of shite. All right, let's go. Jessica Lynn Herringer was born in 1987, living in Norton Shores, Michigan, with her boyfriend Dakota Quail Dyer and her three-year-old son. In the year of 2013, which I think is how they say 13 in American, just good old-fashioned revenge, 25-year-old Jessica Herringer was working at the Exxon gas station and hoping to go back to college to study clackety clackety accounting. That's what accounting is, right? Clackety clackety? And on the 26th of April 2013, Jessica would just straight up vanish from work, from that Exxon gas station under very mysterious and sinister circumstances. And not just that, the day before she vanished, the 25th, would also be, there would also, something would also happen that day that was a little shifty. On the 25th of April 2013, a woman was yapping away with Jessica late as she was getting ready to finish her shift. She usually finished at about 11.30pm. She said to Jessica, hey, you know, you should, you should be careful, you know, young woman working here alone late at night. Maybe you, should, maybe you should ask your boyfriend to come in here and just stay with you. It's also important to note that gas station did not have CCTV or surveillance footage at all. So while she was, you know, yapping away saying this to Jessica, Another customer who also happened to be in the store, a guy, he overheard them and he turned and he was like, She's got customers looking out for her too. Upon hearing this, Jessica apparently just shook her head and shivered. The woman then was like, wow, that's an unusual reaction to have to what that creepy guy just said. But that's weird. So she left the store, but was still thinking about that. Just Jessica's weirded out reaction and she would be left alone with this guy. So she got into her car outside the gas station, got into it, but waited there, and was watching the store with Jessica and the other guy. The other guy would eventually leave, and Jessica would finish up for the night. Nothing happened. Unfortunately, we can't say the same about the following night. On April 26th, TGIF, it was a Friday, Jessica started her shift working at the Exxon store at 4.35 p.m. The shift work was another day in the rig, seemed relatively quiet. Uh, her boyfriend popped in at one point, another friend popped in later, they would pop in just to shoot the shit. At one point, however, during that evening, Jessica's friend and another customer who were in the store noticed a silver van pull up. Now, Jessica at the time was actually outside the store, she was working away on the pumps. And they saw Jessica talk to the driver of this van, seemed to be a friendly conversation laughing, and then the van drove off. Now, they couldn't get a look at who was driving it, only Jessica could, from their perspective inside the store. Later on, a customer would enter the store at about 5 to 11 p.m. Notice nothing amiss. Jessica was there, everything seemed fine. But it wouldn't be in just a few short minutes' time. A few minutes later that night, the manager of that very store was driving by on her motorbike. When she saw a silver van pull off and drive around the back of that gas station. Now she thought that was weird. Why would you drive around the back of it that late at night? Bumps out the front if you need petrol gas. Her first thought was that Jessica was stealing from the store, that the van would pull up at the back and Jessica would just load all the shit into it and then it would drive off. So, being a bit weirded out by it, she drove over on her motorcycle so she could eyeball what was going on. She would later say she saw a figure standing at the rear of the van and noticed the van's rear hatch was open. The figure shut the rear hatch and quickly opened it again as though they were adjusting something in the back of the van. 
before finally closing it. It's important to note that the back door couldn't be opened from the outside, it could only be opened from the inside, there was no door handle outside. The van then drove off. The manager didn't see anything weird, didn't see Jessica, didn't hear any yelling or screaming or anything like that. But as the van was leaving, the manager got a look at who was driving it. She would later say it was a man wearing a red or orange sweatshirt who had wavy or crazy hair. Then she drove off, the van drove off, both going their separate ways. And then just a few short minutes later, at 11.10 p.m., a customer arrived in the store and noticed, well, the lights were on, but nobody's home. I had walked inside, there's nobody, there's a car here, there's a, another car out front, but it just, it's just very suspicious why there's nobody here. Okay, so did you yell or anything? Or? Yeah, I hollered, hey, I, you know, walked around the building. It just, um, I don't know. Jessica was gone. 911 was called and the police arrived. Money was still in the counter. Jessica's purse and jacket were still there. There were no signs of any disturbance at all. That is until at the back door of the store where the van would have been parked for just a few short minutes, officers found blood, about a two inch blob of it. And also nearby, they found the battery cover to a laser sight of a handgun. The police then contacted the manager of the store and well, guess who saw? A silver van parked at the back. That very night, canine units searched the nearby area, but found nothing. Jessica had been taken, but they had nothing. Now, by the way the scene, the Exxon station was, the police were pretty sure and came to the conclusion pretty quickly that Jessica had been abducted by, well, silver van. Turning back to our top story this hour, and what has now become a desperate effort to find a missing mother believed to have been abducted from the gas station where she worked in Norton Shores. 25-year-old Jessica Herring has not been seen since Friday night, and police are now asking for your help in finding her. It was suspected that someone familiar, a regular at the station, was responsible. The suspect van that the manager saw, it had parked at the back of the station. There was no way in from the back door. Nothing was stolen in the station. Nothing was robbed. The cash register was still full of money and Jessica's coat and purse were still left inside. And so, it was suspected that someone possibly lured Jessica out the back, maybe saying they needed help, maybe nabbing her if she was at the back smoking a cigarette, possibly hitting her with a handgun which caused the battery cover of the laser sight on the handgun to break away. And that's why there was blood there too. Bundled her into the van and drove away. One of the people who was in the store that night at around 9pm, when the van originally pulled up and spoke to Jessica while she was outside, spoke to police about what he had seen and told his story to reporters. I think the general banter was like, hey, I thought you're supposed to be inside, not out here, you know, kind of joking almost like it was a regular kind of guy that would come in there and talk to her or whatever. He says they acted as if they knew each other. It seemed almost like construction worker banter you know you hear about the old construction workers that would do cat calls and stuff like that you try to hit on the pretty ladies kind of. cctv footage from around the norton shores area saw the van driving away from the gas station a few cameras picked it up but who was behind the wheel and where it eventually went was unknown and so the search continued they had a sketch of the suspect from who the manager saw behind that Silver at Chrysler, Town & Country. Sketch was all they had. They knew the model of the van, a Silver Chrysler, Town & Country, as I said, but unfortunately, there were around 15,000 of them in Michigan alone. Police mounted a massive search for Jessica using helicopters and canines, but the trail very soon went cold. Over a year after Jessica was abducted from that gas station, on June 29, 2014, a 911 call was made. 911, where is your emergency? We come up to this lady, she's laying in the road. I think she was hit by a car. Okay. She's got a head injury. 
36-year-old Rebecca Bletch was found in the middle of the road. At first, the people who found her thought she had been hit by a car. But when the investigators arrived, it was determined she had been shot in the head while out jogging. This happened 20 minutes from Norton Shores, where Jessica Hiringa disappeared. Police say the victim had been shot three times in the back of the head and reveal that she suffered bruises to her wrists, hands, back, and leg. It's not clear what caused the bruises. Bletch was still alive with a weak pulse when neighbors found her on Automobile Road, not far from her home, just after six in the evening on June 29th. She died a short time later. Investigators say they also found three 22 caliber shell casings near her body. The case of what happened to Rebecca, it, it seemed to possibly be maybe a random attack while she was out jogging, and both the Rebecca Bletch case and Jessica Haringa case would remain cold in eastern Michigan. I like that big old lake they have in eastern Michigan. What's it called? It begins with an M? I don't know. Don't worry about it. And close to two years after the murder of Rebecca Bletch and three years after the disappearance of Jessica Haringa, something happened. In April 2016, a 16-year-old girl was walking home from a party. She said that as she was walking home, she got lost and a man in a silver van pulled up to her, asking if she needed a ride. She didn't, not from him at least, but asked if she could use his phone to call for one. She got in the van to use his and when she did, he immediately pulled away, bombed down the road and yanked out a gun. She was able to jump out of the moving van, and he sped off. Straight after, she ran into a nearby house and the police were called. The police got hold of surveillance footage, and were able to identify the silver van in this attempted abduction. Wouldn't it just so happen to be a silver Chrysler town and country? And later, the teenager was able to pick this, you know, attempted abductor from a lineup. And it was a guy named Jeffrey Willis. And that's it. Besides attempting to abduct this girl, he was also driving the exact same silver Chrysler Town and Country seen when Jessica disappeared. And so, search warrants were issued. The police searched his home and also his van and found some... real nasty shit, I'm not joking. Investigators recovered multiple syringes of liquid that appeared to be a drug or a sedative, and also handcuffs, Viagra, wire restraints, a ball gag, hubba hubba, and a rope from the van. Truth! Not only that, inside the van they found a 22 caliber handgun, and ballistics matched that handgun to the bullets and casings found at the Rebecca Bletch crime scene. And that's that one. And that very same handgun that was found in the van and was used to kill Rebecca, didn't it just so happen to be missing the battery cover of the laser sight attached to it? I wonder where he lost it. And when they got inside his house, it got even worse. On his home computer, they found images of kids, women in bondage, and kidnap and kill videos. Some were acted, some were not. On a hard drive, they found a folder titled VIX. Two folders inside were labeled 4SB and JLH. Rebecca Sue Bletch and Jessica Lynn Hiringa. In those folders were photos of both victims, along with news reports about their cases. They even found a password to several websites, J4L27H13, Jessica's initials, and the date of the day after her disappearance. In the case of the abducted 16-year-old, Jeffrey Willis was charged with kidnapping and assault with a dangerous weapon. He was also charged with Rebecca Bletch's murder. Now, a bit of background about old Jeffrey Willis to learn a bit more about him. He used to be a janitor at an elementary school. Oh dear. However, the principal of that very school learned Jeffrey spent a bit too much time in the computer lab. And when they went on to a computer after he had used it, one of the, you know, going through his history, they found a URL that led to... Well, he was fired. So, the police had quite a bit on this piece of shit. In September of 2016, Jeffrey Willis was charged with Jessica's kidnapping and murder. 
It is a bittersweet day for the Jessica Herringa family. Of course, it's a giant step on the road to justice, but they're still left without their daughter, their mother, and their sister, and that's a void that will never be filled. But they do perhaps have the comfort tonight of knowing the man who may have killed her. Jeffrey Willis, a man prosecutors have called a monster. A month after Jeffrey Willis was arrested, his cousin was also arrested. Kevin Bloom, a prison guard with the Michigan Department of Corrections. What the, what did he have to do with Jeffrey Willis, who was maybe a serial killer? Well, let me tell you, because he could not, Kevin Bloom could not keep his mouth shut. And he probably hated himself for it because he kept changing his story. He told the police that Jeffrey Willis, his cousin, killed Jessica, and that Kevin himself helped get rid of the body. So he told that to the police during an interview. However, while he was saying that, at the very end of that interview, when he said, yeah, I helped my cousin move her body, he then was like, oh yeah, by the way, I just made all that up, guys. Hey, don't worry about it. Overactive imagination, am I right? The lead investigator in the Jessica Herringa case appeared before a judge here at the Muskegon Call of Justice. He told that judge that Kevin Bloom told him that he and Jeffrey Willis were both involved in the Jessica Herringa disappearance. But he quickly recanted that story. Now officials tell us they don't know what to believe. However, he had told police, and he would actually later tell police things about the Rebecca Bletch case also, that were not publicly, you know, public knowledge. There was no way he would know these things if he wasn't involved. The police charged him on two counts of lying to police, upon which Kevin Bloom finally came clean. Kevin pled guilty on both counts. He was sentenced to time served until another charge against him was added. Accessory after the fact. After all, he did tell the police he helped bury Jessica's body. Kevin told the police that the day after Jessica went missing, the 27th of April 2013, Jeffrey, his cousin, had called him over and said, Hey buddy, I got a woman and we're having a party. You're invited. When Kevin arrived, he saw Jessica naked on the floor with a head wound. He told the police that Jeffrey had knocked Jessica unconscious and loaded her into his van. And then brought her home. Kevin and Jeffrey then wrapped her in a sheet and buried her. On November 27, 2017, Kevin Bloom pled no contest to being an accessory after the fact for helping Jeffrey dispose of Jessica's body and was sentenced to time served plus five years probation and to wear a GPS for at least a year. So Kevin Bloom is already out and about. Good for him. But at this point, Jeffrey Willis was still not convicted of Jessica Hiringa's murder. What he was of Rebecca Bletch's. Life, no parole. Well, we do have a verdict in the Jeffrey Willis trial right now in the murder of Rebecca Bletch. Let's listen in. Guilty. <laughs> Jeffrey's motive for killing Rebecca Bletch was, well, when she was out jogging, he drove up alongside her in his good old silver van and tried to kidnap her. When she fought him off, he executed her. Howard. The trial for Jessica Herringa began in May 2018, and as I said, they had quite a bit of shit on Jeffrey Willis. He left quite a trail. However, it was a trail the investigators completely stumbled upon. Jeffrey had been to Jessica's workplace, the Exxon gas station, 15 times before he took her. Remember that guy a customer saw the day before Jessica disappeared? The one who weirded Jessica out when he said, you know, customers are looking out for her too? Well, guess who that guy was identified as? You walked into the gas station that night with Jessica alone? No. Who else was there? Jeffrey Willis. The reason he probably weirded Jessica out was because he'd been coming in there weirdly often and was generally just a creep. They found, well, um, for want of a better word, stuff on his computer. The night Jessica disappeared, he was supposed to work at his factory job, but he never showed up, and didn't show up in the days that followed either. At one point during the search for Jessica, the police received an anonymous tip, and they searched near a cabin that was in the woods. They didn't find anything, obviously. However, a neighbor noticed a couple of days after the police search, they saw Jeffrey Willis out there with a shovel. 
phone records also placed him near the Exxon gas station just hours before Jessica went missing. However, when Jeffrey was questioned about this, he told police he was at home at the time. However, his phone records placed him near his grandfather's house, which is seven minutes from the gas station. During his murder trial, the prosecutor contended that Jeffrey abducted Jessica from the gas station at approximately 11 p.m. Then he brought her to his grandfather's house where he sexually assaulted her before murdering her. That no one has ever seen him along with Miss Harrington. Um, no one's ever seen him assault Miss Harrington. No one's ever seen him drug Miss Harrington. He will be, I believe you will have information that paints him as an evil person and then that may be your judgment. But you will not have evidence that he killed or kidnapped Miss Harrington. And we think in the end, uh, as, as we remind you of your oath, you decide this particular matter is the fact that you don't have anything there is no there there that you don't have the the evidence that you need whether it's CSI or other other sources you don't have the evidence you need to convict my client of the case for which he's actually been charged this morning the defense obviously pled not guilty I mean their defense is their job <laughs> The defense also made a big hullabaloo about the light in the back of the store, the outside light where the van would have been, kidnapping Jessica. The manager of the store, when she was watching the van out the back the day Jessica was taken, said the light was off, it was dark as shit back there. When the police arrived, however, after the 911 call was made, the light, you guessed it, it was shining brightly. The light could only be turned on from inside the store. Therefore, if the light was off when Jessica was taken, who turned it on? The evidence showed that the eyewitness, excuse me, the eyewitness, Susan Follett, when asked, didn't recognize me as the driver of the van, and she testified she remembers every face that comes into the store. Both her and her ex-husband, Eric Tarver, agreed that the light in the back of the store was off when the van left. But both Craig Harpster, the first citizen on the scene, and Corporal Hoxima, the first officer to arrive, both testified that this light that can only be turned on from inside the Exxon station was on when they arrived. In that few minutes of time between the van leaving and Harpster's arrival, someone else had to have turned this light back on. The, max, the maxim, Occam's Razor, which states, in explaining something, no more assumptions should be made than what is necessary, comes to mind here. It seems blatantly obvious to me that this town and country van the police so adamantly searched for had absolutely nothing to do with Miss Harrington's disappearance and was all just a prosecutorial red herring. I too fell into this group of fantasy thinkers believing the police could be trusted with not fucking up an investigation. They suggested that the van seen behind the gas station belonged to somebody else. That van belonged to somebody else. Come on. The police said themselves there was 15,000 of them in Michigan alone. And the reason he went to that particular gas station so often is because it was on his way to work. It was his route. They said that whoever, whoever actually owned that Chrysler Silver Town and Country, yeah, whoever actually owned it, they're the ones who took Jessica. They're probably buying drugs for her. I mean, it did come out at one point. Jessica's boyfriend said that she was addicted to heroin at the time. And then there was the fact that there was nobody. Nobody, no crime. I heard that's the law. Yeah. Not one open murder. Guilty of first degree murder. Guilty of first degree premeditated and first degree felony murder. Count two, kidnapping, guilty. Okay, thank you. You may be seated. After an hour and a half, the jury found Jeffrey Willis guilty of Jessica Herringa's kidnapping and murder on May 16th, 2018. He received a life sentence with a parole a month later. Um, I have something I'd like to say, but I have nothing to add to that. Okay. Go right ahead. Pardon me? Go right ahead. You said, 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 you, said you had something you wanted to say. Go right ahead. I am innocent. I stand before you today proof that the promise of Gideon is dead. Not only did the justice system for indigent defense fail here, but the promise of equal protection and due process as well. 
Our system of government relies on many principles. Two of these are a belief that everyone deserves justice equally and that money shouldn't be part of that equation, but also a fair and balanced approach to that justice is consistent with the fundamental principles of liberty which lie at the base of all of our civil and political institutions. These trials were just an exercise in feudalistic justice. Catch them, flog them, imprison them. The disillusionment with the ideals of American values played a big part in what happened here in this courtroom. Quite honestly, Judge, uh, in my career, uh, and I've been doing this now uh, almost 19 years, uh, this man is probably one of the most dangerous men that I hope to ever encounter. In my career. He shows no remorse, no lack, no no ounce of dignity or integrity. Uh, and it's clear that the justice system has the right place for him. And that's behind bars for the rest of his natural life. It goes to show that uh, we have successfully locked up an individual who, had he not been caught and captured, would have continued his killing in this particular community. So uh, with that, Judge, uh, I'm going to sleep very well tonight uh, knowing that uh, Mr. Wilson never see the light of day again. Thank you. And after all of this, Jessica's body, it's never been found. What's terrifying in this case is that you know, if that teenager hadn't, bravely, jumped out of his moving van and reported him to police when he tried to abduct her, Jeffrey Willis may have never been caught. You know, it's one of those cases where it's, it was kind of pure chance that it was solved. It was kind of like, um, Sean Great, uh, Todd Colehep, Israel Keys. You know, these, these really terrifying ones when, when it was like the killer messed up and that's how they got caught. Which makes you think, which makes you wonder, how many of these guys are actually out there doing stuff like this? They just haven't been caught. Sleep well. Thank you so, so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I will see you, as always, real soon in the next video. Take care of yourselves. Mike out.